I'm very excited to give this talk on hypersensitivity pneumonitis at the Society of Thoracic Radiology Resident Boot Camp. I'm Jonathan Chung, Professor of Radiology and Vice Chair of Quality and Section Chief of Thoracic Radiology at the University of Chicago Medicine. I want to thank the committee for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and get started. These are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent directly to this talk. So if after this talk, you are better able to stratify hypersensitivity cases or cases of suspected hypersensitivity pneumonitis using the new diagnostic guidelines, you're able to recognize high confidence imaging patterns of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, whether fibrotic or non-fibrotic, and you're able to list typical distributions of high confidence patterns of hypersensitivity pneumonitis on imaging, specifically CT, I feel like I would have been successful. So last year, we published a multi-society, multidisciplinary guideline on diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. A substantial portion of this paper is actually devoted to imaging guidance as it pertains to hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Obviously, in the time allotted, we can't go into much detail in this regard, even if we were to limit ourselves solely to the imaging aspect of this guideline. So I'm gonna hit the high points, but I strongly encourage you to read this paper. You really have to read this paper. It's, uh, it won't take you that long, but there's a lot of good data in there, a lot of good pearls. Otherwise, you're gonna be left with gaps in your knowledge in regard, how to, in regard to how you approach patients with suspected hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So as you can see here, HRCT and radiologists really are central to the diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It's really the first step here. First step after someone suspects hypersensitivity pneumonitis, really you should be getting HRCT very early in that patient's diagnostic clinical workup. And in my mind, because of the heterogeneity of the way hypersensitivity pneumonitis can present clinically, Anyone with interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, HP, hypersensitive pneumonitis, should be on the differential diagnosis, and HRCT really is essential to that workup. Based on the HRCT pattern, we should try to determine the likelihood or diagnostic competence of hypersensitivity pneumonitis using a three-point scale. Either we call it typical for HP, compatible with HP, or indeterminate for HP. And then in combination with other data, including exposure history, IgG antigen testing, bronchoalveolar lavage results, and histopathology, in some cases, we would be able to figure out the diagnostic confidence of hypersensitivity pneumonitis in that specific case. So one of the first takeaways in regard to the HP diagnostic guidelines is that we are moving away from trying to subcategorize hypersensitivity pneumonitis cases based on temporality. So previously, most people would try to subcategorize hypersensitivity pneumonitis into either uh, the acute bin, the subacute bin, or the chronic bin. And that has been problematic for many reasons. So now we're actually espousing that you subcategorize hypersensitivity pneumonitis into a more logical fibrotic versus non-fibrotic uh, patterns. And that has obviously uh, ramifications from a diagnostic standpoint, given that we know that non-fibrotic HP cases, uh, it's easier in many cases to make a diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis in patients without fibrosis, because as fibrosis tends to progress, the different subtypes of pulmonary fibrosis start to run into each other. They start to look similar. So the less fibrosis you have, oftentimes the easier it is to make a diagnosis, especially if all you have is the images with sparse clinical workup. So that's number one. Uh, but number two, if you have fibrosis, now that we, we know that these antifibrotics seem to work in all progressive types of pulmonary fibrosis, you have that a treatment regimen available to you as well. Though this talk is not really geared toward therapy, again, we're really geared for diagnosis. But bottom line, I think one of the big takeaways is that, again, instead of trying to subcategorize hypersensitive pneumonitis using temporality, we're really going to try to use morphology, so fibrosis versus non-fibrosis, to help us. Now let's talk about the indeterminate pattern for HP. So this is essentially any CT pattern that is not typical or compatible with HP. We're not gonna to go to the details into it because we just don't have the time. 
But this is, I think, a good reminder for all of us that HP is heterogeneous in terms of its imaging manifestations. And so in some cases, it'll be classic, other cases, it won't. And so based on imaging, one cannot rule out HP, though if it has a high confidence pattern, you can maybe not rule in HP, but it could be very high in the differential diagnosis, both on imaging and both on clinical workup. Let's talk about the three density pattern now. So the three density pattern is essentially coined to replace head cheese sign. So I actually, personally, I love the head cheese sign. Uh, it's something that I think I was trained with and not just in fellowship, but in residency, but it seems like this is actually much more popular in the US and across the world. So now the three density pattern has essentially replaced the head cheese sign, though diagnostically has the same ramifications. Still highly suggestive hypersensitivity pneumonitis with the data being richest and most convincing in fibrotic disease. Here's an example of the head cheese sign. So we see examples of, uh, with, of low density areas with secondary pulmonary lobular margination, which are areas of air trapping. We see intermediate density areas, again, margin by the edge of the secondary pulmonary lobules. These are essentially normal lung. And then the more most hypodense areas, these areas of ground glass abnormality, those are areas of inflammation. So you get these three different densities in the same lung marginated by the edges of secondary pulmonary lobules. This is formerly known as the head sheath sign. Now we'll call it the three density pattern and highly suggestive hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is head cheese, but again, doesn't matter because we're not calling it head sheath sign anymore. I'll miss that sign, but uh, that's the new nomenclature is three density pattern. All right, so let's discuss what the literature tells us about imaging non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and how this data was adopted into the new imaging guidelines in hypersensitivity. So the data suggests that in patients with non-fibrotic disease, the distribution is almost always diffuse, both in the axial and the zonal plane. So zonal plane is superior inferior direction. Ground glass opacity is almost always present. And in about half of cases, you're gonna see central lobular nodularity, usually of ground glass attenuation. In the vast majority of cases, you're gonna see superimposed mosaic attenuation or air trapping. Even the head cheese sign, again, now we're calling that the three density pattern. And I will tell you that in non-fibrotic disease, as I alluded to before, it's probably easiest to make a high confidence diagnosis of HP then compared to fibrotic HP. This is the, the table that goes with the different diagnostic levels of confidence for hypersensitivity pneumonitis on imaging. This is in the guidelines. I encourage you, again, please read the guidelines or else you're going to have holes in your knowledge. So what is considered a high confidence typical non-fibrotic HP pattern according to the guidelines? You have to have at least one HRC abnormality suggesting parenchymal infiltration. So that's ground glass opacity or mosaic attenuation. But in this case, mosaic attenuation really is from lobular areas of, of inflammation rather than lobular areas of air trapping. And you have to have at least one HRC abnormality suggesting small airway disease, whether it's central lobular nodularity or air trapping. And all these abnormalities have to be present in a diffuse distribution. We see some case examples here. So here we see diffuse ground glass abnormality. Someone might make the argument there's some central lobular ground glass nodularity, but clearly there's superimposed mosaic attenuation. And on expiration, we see that these areas of mosaic attenuation represent air trapping. They stay equally as black on inspiration as do expiration, these areas of hypodensity, so that's air trapping. And on the coronal plane, we see that indeed this is a diffuse process, both in the superior inferior direction, as well as in the axial plane of the CT scan. So this is typical non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Another example here, this I think really shows a nice example of the central lobular ground glass nodularity we see bilaterally. We know their central lobular nodularity because they give you relative subpleural sparing. And by definition, uh, central lobular nodularity should give you subpleural sparing just based on the secondary pulmonary lobular anatomy. And we see superimposed areas of mosaic attenuation bilaterally, pretty extensive there, likely representing air trapping. Here's a blow up of the right lung, which I think brings out that central lobular ground glass nodularity very well. Also shows some more confluent ground glass abnormality within the medial aspect of that right lung. And this minimum intensity projection image really brings out the secondary pulmonary lobular uh, anatomy or the areas of mosaic attenuation, which were shown to represent air trapping in this patient with non-fibrotic HP. That's a typical pattern. Another typical pattern here we see in the upper aspect of the lungs on this axial image, we see diffuse ground glass abnormality. Lower down, we see actually more of a central lobular prominence here, and there's mild mosaic attenuation as well. 
Here's a coronal reformation, which shows that this pattern indeed is the diffuse process. Again, another example of typical non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, perhaps a little more subtle given that the, the small airway component is a little bit harder to see. So just a little bit of mosaic attenuation. It's there, but not as florid as the other cases, but the central lobular nodularity really is another manifestation of small airway disease. So let's discuss what the literature tells us about the imaging in fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and how this data has now been adopted into the new imaging guidelines for our HP diagnosis. So as compared to non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, in fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the distribution is much more heterogeneous. So I'm sure you guys have heard that fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis is upper lung preponderant or mid or upper lung preponderant with relative basal or sparing. Uh, the truth of the matter is if you read the studies themselves, even uh, up to a slight majority of cases will actually be basal predominant, which we know is much more common in usual interstitial pneumonitis as well as nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. So this is again, just an example for us to remember that in patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the imaging pattern is very often heterogeneous, especially in the setting of fibrotic lung disease. In fact, it's, uh, I think most people would agree that it's much easier in most cases to make a diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis before there's fibrosis or before there's significant fibrosis, as opposed to when there's severe fibrosis. And that's just again, because as fibrosis progresses, after a while, the different subtypes of pulmonary fibrosis start to run into each other. They start to look similar. So on imaging, what are you looking for? Obviously findings of pulmonary fibrosis, things like reticulation, traction bronchiectasis and bronchiectasis, as well as subpleural honeycombing and architectural distortion. Mosaic attenuation and air trapping, so manifestations of small airway disease are less common, only about half of cases, which is much lower prevalence than non-fibrotic lung disease in HP. So what happens to these areas of air trapping and mosaic attenuation? No one really knows. It just seems to be less uh, common and less severe in fibrotic lung disease in HP. And here is a table that talks about the different uh, the different uh, subcategories of fibrotic HP that we see here, typical, compatible, and indeterminate for hypersensitivity pneumonitis, so essentially levels of confidence. Again, we don't have the time to go into all the detail. So really, for, for the purpose of this talk, we're gonna talk about the typical fibrotic HP pattern. So what is a typical fibrotic HP pattern? You have to, first of all, have findings of pulmonary fibrosis, which I alluded to before. But in addition to that, you have to have at least one of these abnormalities indicative of small airway disease. So either poorly defined central lobular nodules, often of ground glass attenuation, mosaic attenuation, the three density pattern, which again has taken the place of the head sheet sign or frank air trapping. And then you have to have a typical distribution of the fibrotic disease. So the categories include a random distribution, which to me means really diffuse distribution, mid lung disease, or relative basal or sparing, which to me means mid or upper lung preponderance. If you read the guidelines, you'll notice that pure upper lung preponderance disease is not part of the typical fibrotic distribution. That's actually part of the compatible with fibrotic HP distribution. But in my mind, I think if you if you have a upper lung preponderance disease with at least one abnormality indicative of small airway disease, I think that that's one can make an argument that that's typical fibrotic HP because if it's upper lung preponderance, just by definition, you have relative basal or sparing. So here's an example where we see a lot of these cystic abnormalities within the lower lobes, also within the uh, other portion lungs as well, more anteriorly, but mostly in the lower lobes. So some of these areas represent traction bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis. There's probably some subpleural honeycombing in there as well. When we look at the coronal reformation, we'll see these lobular areas of lower density. So these areas of mosaic attenuation, highly likely to represent air trapping. And we see the distribution of lung disease, specifically the fibrosis really is up, is mid or upper lung preponderant, but mostly mid lung preponderant. And there is this background of hazy ground glass abnormality. So this is a fibrotic HP pattern, typical fibrotic HP pattern. Another example here, these are two different patients where we see fibrosis on the left-hand image here being upper lung and mid lung preponderant, depending on the lung that you're looking at. Clearly, we can at least say there's relative basal or sparing and there's superimposed mosaic attenuation as shown by those yellow arrows. So that small airway disease with that typical distribution of pulmonary fibrosis, this is a typical pattern of fibrotic HP.
Another patient here on the right, this patient has more of a diffuse pattern of pulmonary fibrosis in the zonal plane in, in terms of the distribution. Maybe has a little bit of upper lung preponderance, but for let's say for the purpose of this talk, let's call it a zonally diffuse. And we look at the lung bases, and actually in the mid aspect of the lungs as well, and we see a lot of mosaic attenuation, highly likely to represent air trapping. And so that conglomeration of findings is typical of fibrotic HP. Another example here, so three sequential axial images shows us that the, this patient has zonally diffuse or zonally random uh, pulmonary fibrotic distribution and there's superimposed mosaic attenuation, lots of mosaic attenuation, these dark areas margin, margin by the edges of secondary pulmonary lobules. On expiration, we see that these areas indeed represent air trapping. They stay equally black on inspiration as they do expiration. So these are true areas of air trapping hypersensitivity pneumonitis, high, it's typical uh, fibrotic HP pattern. Another example here, we see axial and coronal plane. We see that the pulmonary fibrosis is mid and upper lung preponderant. We also see the superimposed ground glass opacity and clear mosaic attenuation. Uh, I think this actually is a decent example of the three density pattern. We see areas that are, are hyper dense. We see areas that are lower density and we see intermediate density areas as well. So three density pattern. And so this patient with mid and upper lung preponderant pulmonary fibrosis and findings of small airway disease, this is a fibrotic HP pattern. So in summary, we talked about the new HP diagnostic guidelines. Again, I encourage you to read the full paper. If you don't read the full paper, you're gonna have holes in your knowledge base. I think we just kind of like you hit this from a 30,000 point of feet uh, point of view. You know, obviously we didn't have the time to go into so much detail. So I really encourage you to read that paper. I think some takeaways here, remember that instead of trying to categorize things based on temporality and hypersensitivity and immunized, we're gonna categorize it based on presence or absence of fibrosis. Establishing level of confidence is important in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, both in fibrotic and non-fibrotic disease. So try to use that nomenclature, typical, compatible with, or uh, indeterminate for. And remember the three density pattern has now taken the place of head cheese sign, though I will miss that head cheese sign. I really like that. Here's some audience response questions here. So what is the zonal distribution of typical non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis? So zonal distribution is superior inferior plane. What's a typical uh, zonal distribution of non-fibrotic HP? Give you a second to think about this. So the answer is diffuse. I think most of you probably guys already got that. Probably pretty easy. How about this? What is not considered a zonal distribution of typical fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis? So we made a big deal about this. So lower, right? So lower is not considered a zonal distribution of typical fibrotic HP. That's more suggestive of UIP and NSIP, though again, depending on who you read, there's gonna be a substantial proportion of fibrotic HP cases, which will be basal or predominant. So just because something is basal or predominant doesn't mean you can rule out HP. In fact, you, you really can't rule out HP based on imaging. You cannot do it. You may be able to rule it in or strongly consider HP on imaging, but you can never completely rule out HP based on imaging. Just impossible. And here's our last audience response question. The intermediate density area in the three density pattern represents what? And I think you guys probably already got this because I talked about this already. It's normal lung. That middle density area is our areas of normal lung. All right. Well, anyways, that brings us to the end of this talk. Uh, thank you guys for your attention. Thank you for uh, watching this video. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter as well. So most of the content that I post on Twitter is educational related, uh, usually interstitial lung disease, but not always, but definitely in the realm of radiology. And uh, I regularly post uh, educational videos as well. Anyways, thank you. Have a great day.